Well, I'm back. Here we go. No, I'm not <laughs> preaching today. Don't worry. This is all good. Um, I have the pleasure, though, of introducing our guest speaker. I'll invite him up right now. His name is Terry Fawson, and I made the joke earlier that he's Terry who goes from Carbon and will be Carbon, right? So he originates from a small town named Carbon. That's right. Um, oh, that's good. good. That's good. Yeah, I that's like a good that. Joke, right? That's right, because I'm carbonated, you yeah. know, that's why. You that's, know, right. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I've had the pleasure of knowing Terry basically the whole time I've been out here. He was a professor for me, but also he may be known to some of you as a pastor at Central or our regional minister as well. So we're blessed to have you here with us today, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. So good to be here. I always, always love to come to West Meadows. As, as Pastor Andrew has said, we, uh, my wife and I had privilege to be here at, many years ago coming to speak relatively frequently and uh, enjoyed uh, getting to know the congregation then. But I also want to say as part of the Alberta Baptist Association, West Meadows is a key uh, congregation that has been uh, ministering uh, throughout the association for decades and we really, really count it essential that we understand that what we do as an association of churches together is what we choose to do. We are associated not because we are forced into some kind of a denominational structure, but because we want to associate together, believing we can do way much, way more together than we can ever do by ourselves. So uh, we uh, are glad that you as a key congregation have been part of this Association of Churches, of 60 churches for, for so long. And we thank you for your ongoing prayerful involvement in and around the many ministries of the association, which you can find out as you get on the uh, ABA website. Just check nab.ca and you'll come to the Alberta Baptist Association website or give me a call at any time. Um, we'll love to chat. And I'm particularly pleased um, that that I was invited today because uh, Pastor Mark uh, let me know when he invited me that we would be looking at the Sermon on the Mount, particularly at the Beatitudes. You know, the Sermon on the Mount is really that key scripture in the book of Matthew and in Luke as well, which is an effective operating manual about relationships. And the Beatitudes are eight statements about the nature of what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. And so these are pivotal truths that we want to take a uh, look at, even uh, have been, and want to, I, I'm glad to be part of that sinking in with you this morning. Let's pray together as we open up God's word. Lord, this is your word. This is truth that can only come alive within our lives as your Holy Spirit brings it into that life. We pray that you would be working in your, through your word in our hearts, in our lives, in these moments, but also carrying on from what you have in your word for us in our day to day. Thank you for West Meadows. Thank you for the ministries that have been operating through this important and a, an exciting congregation for so long, and we pray that you would continue to chart the course forward for this church as we as your followers are equipped for the work that you have for each one of us beyond these, these moments together in, in the days, weeks, months, years ahead that we have while you give us breath on this planet. Thank you for this time now around your word. We pray that you lead us. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. My strength is as the strength of ten because my heart is pure. That's what Sir Galahad, a seasoned soldier of renown, brought to life by the classic pen of Tennyson, was depicted as someone who had purity of heart, as a virtue to be emulated, purity of heart, as a passion to be pursued. So said Sir Galahad. But it was Jesus who explained why. In the sixth of the eight Beatitudes from his Sermon on the Mount, in this sixth 
attitude for being, be attitude in, this, in the kingdom of God, in this sixth statement about the nature of citizens in the, in the kingdom of God, about the nature of our lives in Jesus Christ, Jesus declared what we read in Matthew 5, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart. Happy or fortunate are the pure in heart. To be envied, to be congratulated are the pure in heart. Why? For they shall see God. Have you seen God lately? Can anybody really make such a claim? Because the scriptures are also clear in this. Even as we hear the Lord respond to Moses' desire to see God, saying in Exodus 33, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. So there is certainly an eternal application to Jesus' teaching in the sixth beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God in glory. Those transformed by the wonder of his grace will be blessed by the glory of his face. And this is something of what Paul the Apostle was referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, where he said, Now we see through a glass darkly, then we will see face to face. Now we know in part, then I shall know just as I am known. So it's a truth that we will see God if our hearts have been made pure as we enter into that eternal presence with the living God. But when Jesus categorically declared in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, he was addressing the now as much as the not yet. He was addressing life in the kingdom now as well as in eternity. He was explaining the most wonderful truth that unlike the standard seclusion of kings in the, ancient, in the ancient Near East, unlike the standard distance between a typical king and his subjects, as citizens in the kingdom of God, we can have access to the king of the kingdom. We can have access to the Lord of Lords, the God of all creation, that because of his redemptive work at Calvary, purifying our hearts, removing the impurities, the sins in our lives, which really are the inhibitors to our relationship with God, because of his work at Calvary, we can, as the writer of Hebrews celebrates, we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can confidently draw near to the Almighty. We can commune with the King. We can see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. So those of us who are citizens in the kingdom, those whose Hearts have been made pure, have the ongoing privilege of seeing God, of knowing what he's like, of, of being in relationship with him. And, and we all know that we experience this most commonly in our prayer dynamic, however we want to understand that prayer dynamic to be. We engaged in it just moments ago as Pastor Andrew was lead, leading us. But this prayer dynamic is, is whatever it means for you and I to commune with the living God, with the king of the, of the kingdom, as we speak with him, as we hear his voice in a variety of ways, through his word, through his still small voice, as we have that relationship dynamic with the living God because our hearts have been made pure. But of course, we all know that even though we do have full access to God, to be with God, if, if, if that's even something that we've ever uh, paused to take uh, seriously, if we have this full access to really know God, even though Jesus has sacrificially purified our hearts to enable us, you and I, to see God, the reality of seeing God on a day-to-day -day basis, 
the opportunity of remaining connected in our relationship with God has to do with the challenge of keeping our hearts pure. So how do we do that? Well, to answer that, it's important for us to understand, again, the biblical notion of the heart. I shared this a little bit with some of the men in this, in this congregation last January as we had uh, men's breakfast together. The biblical notion of the heart, in particular, the Hebrew truth about the heart as it's depicted in the scriptures, as it would have been assumed by Jesus, in the sixth beatitude, Jesus was, of course, referring to the heart, not in biological terms, but as a reference to that place in our being where decisions are being made. That's how the Hebrews understood it. That's the, that's the biblical perspective of the heart, where emotion and intellect and will operate and cooperate so as to impact the decision-making center of our being, to, to shape our character, influencing our relationships, charting the course of our lives. As such, the heart refers to the control center of our being. And that's why the greatest of all commandments insists that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of the control center of our being, with all of our decision making. That's why we read in Romans 8.27 that God searches the heart. We read that repeatedly throughout the scriptures. That's why we're exhorted in the wisdom of the Proverbs to guard the heart, protect the heart with all diligence because from the heart flow the springs of life. All of these scriptures point to what Jesus assumes in the Sermon on the Mount, that life, and indeed the giver of life, operates from within us, from the locale of our decision-making, from that control center of our entire being. So is it any wonder that purity of heart becomes that pivotal condition to being able to see God? to being able to, to really be in relationship with God, and as such, it becomes a basis for receiving blessing from God. Blessed are the pure in heart. To be congratulated are the pure in heart in the, in the decision-making of their being. For they are the ones who will really see God. So what do we know of this kind of purity? Well, in the kingdom of God, purity of heart is first a matter of purging. The Greek word for pure, as we find it in the sixth beatitude, is the word katharos. It refers to something that's clean, in contrast to that which is soiled or dirty. Katharos, clean, like, like the clothes of a four-year-old on the way to church on Sunday morning in contrast to the clothes of that four-year-old after lunch, after church, going home on Sunday afternoon. Catharos, or clean, like, like a cup of water that's made its way through the Edmonton City water treatment plant and through that normal cl uh, chlorination process, maybe through a Brita water filter in contrast to a cup of water that you dip out of the North Saskatchewan just by the other side of Refinery Row. Catharos, clean, like a conscience that's found forgiveness and joy and release and victory through the liberating process of confession and restitution in contrast to the conscience that's laden down with the weight of guilt and fear and bitterness and defeat. The heart which is catharos, pure, is the heart that's undergone, you've got it, catharsis. Catharsis, that Greek word, that cleansing, which we hear David long ago describe in, in Psalm 51, following the revelation of his sin with Bathsheba as he cries out to God saying, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, purify me with hyssop that I may be clean, wash me that I may be whiter than snow, create in me a clean 
Catharsis heart, O God, and renew an upright spirit within me. Catharsis refers to that purging of every undesirable element which Isaiah experienced after recognizing in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, where we know that, that, that great hymn of faith was, was drawn from, holy, 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 where, where Isaiah saw a vision of who God is and he said, ruined, that's what I am, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. And then one of the seraphim fly down to him with a burning coal in his hand, which he's taken from the altar with tongs and he touches Isaiah's mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity has been catharsis, has been purged. Your sin is forgiven. Catharsis refers to that refining, that smelting, that burning away of the dross as we prophetically discover it portrayed in Malachi chapter 3 where the Lord himself functions as a refiner's fire who will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, who will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Catharsis refers to that purification from any pollutant to which the writer of Hebrew pushes us all as he echoes the very words of Jesus saying in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, pursue after the purification without which no one will ever be able to see the Lord. Blessed are the cleansed of heart. Blessed are the refined in heart. Blessed are the purged of heart, the pure in heart. Blessed are those who undergo catharsis, as difficult as that can be. For they shall have obstacles to God removed. For they shall have all that which obscures an intimate relationship with God taken away. They shall see God. And of course, the necessity of this Catharsis is ubiquitous. It's everywhere needed. The need for cleansing is no respecter of persons. I am continually amazed when I've ever had occasion to meet people of stature that even they put their pants on one leg at a time. (laughs) They're just like everyone else. I don't know if it's more comforting or distressing to feel a measure of kinship with historical greats like the legendary Leonardo da Vinci. According to legend, some young boys were visiting this famous artist. One of them knocked over a stack of his canvases and it upset Leonardo because he was working quietly and sensitively. He became angry. He took his paintbrush and and hurled it with harsh words at these boys, especially one unfortunate little guy who ran crying from the studio. The artist was then alone again and continued with his work, trying, of all things, to paint the face of Jesus. And he couldn't do it. His creativity had dried up. Leonardo da Vinci put down his brush. He went out and walked the streets, the alleys, until he found that little guy and said, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. Forgive me, even as Christ forgives. I've done something worse than you. You knocked over the canvases, but by my anger, I've blocked the flow of God in my life. Will you come back with me? And he took the boy by the hand, back to the studio with him, and they both smiled as the face of Jesus came quite naturally from the master's brush, and that face has been an inspiration to millions ever since. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It took a a catharsis, a refining, a purging, a cleansing of the heart for Leonardo da Vinci to see God, to have the scales fall off from the eyes of his heart for beauty and significance and wonder to to return to his life, for him to be able to make an impact on the world, for a really miracle to unfold in his life as it is for any one of us. 
as regularly as we find it necessary to scrub our hands and face, to take a shower, to soak in a tub, to wash the outer body, we should logically expect to implement some routine for cleansing our innermost being, uh, purifying our hearts, that decision-making center of our being, for ensuring the removal of any relational obstacles between ourselves and God, as well as between ourselves and others, because heart matters are always relational matters. The basis for that kind of cleansing routine is found, of course, in the practice of confession, where According to 1 John 1, 9, scripture that many of us know very well, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to keep on forgiving us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Our role in this, though sometimes difficult, even painful, is simple and straightforward. But notice most significantly in this passage that the actual cleansing the function of catharsis is still left in the hands of our Lord. If we confess, if we acknowledge our need for cleansing, our need for purifying, our need to get rid of those obstacles from God, he is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us. It's not like he's going to go, no, it's you again. Come back some other time when you've got it more serious. No, no, he's faithful to forgive us and cleanse us. This reflection of God's sovereignty and grace, even pertaining to matters of the heart, which is found all throughout the scriptures, is accentuated in Ezekiel chapter 36, 26, where we hear God say, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Which begs the question whenever I read that, do I have his new spirit operative within me? I mean, I do, as he's given us that. All of us who are choosing to follow him, he's given us his Holy Spirit, but is his spirit operating within me? Am I blessed with that new pure heart today, tomorrow, the next day? Are all of us, any of us, are we, are we getting so cleansed of heart that it is easier to be in the presence of God and to see his face and to see his desires and to know his longings and to, to know what he wants in this world. It begins by confession, by your confession, my confession, our complete truth about the need for our cleansing and then it's completed with his work of cleansing in our lives. If we say we have no sins, we're, we're lying, we read in 1 John. The truth isn't in us. We know that we struggle day by day with these things. And what the Lord wants us to do is to understand right from the beginning of his teachings about the kingdom of God in, in the Sermon on the Mount and these Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Are you having trouble in your connection with God? There may just be something that needs some catharsis. In the kingdom of God, purity of heart is first a matter of purging, which then leads to a matter of purpose. Have you ever seen gold or silver or any precious metal prior to the refining or the purifying process? Apart from the trained eye, the discerning eye, one kind of dirt looks like just like another kind of dirt. You know, one earthen ore looks just like the next. It's hardly distinguishable one from another. It's only after the impurities are skimmed away, are purged away, that the beauty and effectiveness of these precious metals, like gold, become apparent. It's only after gold is made pure that gold can live up to its purpose. It's only after the heart is made pure that the heart can live up to its purpose. A pure heart is a sincere heart. It's a genuine heart, an unadulterated heart. A pure heart belongs to someone with focus, with, with, with a singleness of purpose. 
a pure heart to find someone who operates on the basis of integrity as, a, as opposed to duplicity. A person whose words and works are consistent, whose actions faithfully follow their attitudes. It was Billy Graham who commented on purity of heart, saying, if we are truly pure in our hearts, we will have a single-minded devotion to the will of God. Our motives will be unmixed. Our thoughts will not be adulterated by those things which are not right. As it turns out, that which most commonly pollutes our hearts, that which confuses our purpose and obscures our capacity to see God and what he wants and, and his desires for us and in, our, in this world, those things can be most commonly characterized as that which is distracting. And aren't our lives full of distractions? Mine is. Everything, everything from busyness to boredom can be distractive. Everything from careers to carousing can be distractive. From sinning to searching can be distractive. From dialogue to dianetics, from tradition to trash, from gardening to gambling, sports to snorts. I don't know about that. Everything from miles to styles, from religion to rebellion. Distractions are all around us. Some of them positive, others are putrid. But all of them are dangerous to the singleness of purpose, to the consistency of passion which defines the pure in heart. Some years ago, Hollywood came out with a blockbuster hit of a movie. A true story surrounding the lives of two Olympic class runners. <whistles> da, 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 da. You getting it? You know? Both of them had a passion to run like the wind. If you remember that movie, maybe if you haven't seen it, you, you might want to find that one on some streaming center or whatever. But both of them had the passion to run like the wind, a true story. As you may recall, one had, was distracted by the passion almost to his ruin. The other was undistracted by running, by the normal enticements of fame and fortune or the seduction of success. The other depicted the life of that Scottish Olympian who went on to become a foreign missionary, who was a young man pure in heart, purged from distractions, purposed to be a man after God's own heart, blessed, fortunate, to be envied, to be congratulated because he could see God, even in the midst of his ability to run like the wind. You remember that line? God has made me for a purpose, but God has made me to run for his pleasure. You know? Story, of course, was made into a movie called Chariots of Fire. Some centuries ago, the scriptures record another blockbuster drama of its own, a true life story surrounding the life of a young religious leader, a man of purpose, a man purged from the normal distractions of life in his passionate pursuit of God, a man who seemed to be pure in heart even as he rose to the top rung of the zealous ladder of faith and tradition, but a man who was not so blessed as to see God until he encountered God on the road to Damascus. The story is recorded for us in the book of Acts, chapter 9. It's incredible, isn't it? Even ironic that it took blindness for Saul of Tarsus to actually see God. To no longer be distracted by his religious ambitions, his traditions and beliefs, his passionate pursuit of God. It took blindness for Saul of Tarsus to recognize that Jesus was and always had been pursuing him in order for Paul to, to live with a purity of heart. So what does it take in our lives to see God? To hear his voice, to, to know his heart, his passions, his agenda, his will for our lives, for this world. What does it take in our lives for God to become visible? It takes hearts purged completely, consistently. 
within the context of confession of our absolute dependence upon God's provision. And it takes hearts purposed, focused, with undistracted singleness of intellect and emotion and will. Pure hearts, blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Not they might see God if, if God's in the mood or there if they're lucky or something like that. No. To be congratulated are the pure in heart. They shall see God. But we should not be mistaken in believing that this is some kind of arrogant, otherworldly, holier-than-our kind of purity. Quite to the contrary. This kind of purity comes to life in life. It comes to life in our day-to-day. In fact, this kind of purity comes to life in the normal. This kind of purity flourishes even in the mundane and the routine. One classic theologian comments about this, saying, the pure in heart find God in the lowliest tasks. They find God among the pots and pans and giving thanks that a cosmic sun has glinted the commonest table. The pure in heart sing their holy, holy, holy in all seasons, for they know, though sometimes only when God has passed by, that the whole earth is filled with his glory. They ask no reward or they would be no longer pure in heart. Such purity, such singleness of heart is its own heaven. So again, as we hear Jesus say, blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. That which begs is, have you seen God lately? Are you seeing God today? Has he been speaking to you as you've risen from, from your night's rest, as you've enjoyed the sustenance of a good breakfast, as you've made your way to worship, or as you're in your homes worshiping this morning? Jesus said that in the kingdom, we can see God. In fact, seeing God remains one of those key indicators that we are in the kingdom, that we are citizens of the kingdom of God, but it requires that our hearts have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. To be citizens in the kingdom of God requires that our hearts have been made pure by the cleanser of our souls and that our hearts remain pure. That the decision-making center of our being, our hearts, remain so purged that they retain their purpose. That the decision-making center of our being remains so refined that it stays focused as our Lord, by his Holy Spirit, keeps us clean, that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Oh, I can see clearly now. The rain is gone. All of the dark clouds have disappeared. To quote a famous poet, it's all about purity of heart. In this, we can be clear about who God is. Purity of heart. In this, we can be clear about who we are, about our Lord's desire for us, about our Lord's love for us. In this, we can be clear about what yet needs to be done for our Lord's desire for this world to be realized, what yet needs to be done about our Lord's love for this world through us. In this, we can see God, his purposes, his agendas, his desires, his love for us. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. O living God, to see you for who you are, to have a a clarity of truth soaking in our being of your love and of your holiness, of your 
of your grace and your truth, of your magnificence and your imminence, of your greatness and your approachability, to see the truth of who you really are is transformative for me today. And for each one of us, Lord, as your followers, we confess, Lord, that we need you to keep us clean in our innermost, to be, to be purifying our heart. Purify my heart. Make me as, as pure gold. Purify our hearts, Lord, that we will be able to be your most effective representatives in this world so that we can reflect your glory in the day-to-day -day of those all around us. Purify our hearts so that we can be full of life and discover the truth of what you said so long ago that we are to be blessed and congratulated. We get to see who you really are. And Lord, as we see you, our response is just to humbly say, we love you and we worship you even as we pray in your name. Amen. Amen.